Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Human Cell Atlas Biological Network Seminar, which is going to feature the nervous system network today. So uh, the seminar goals are to increase the biological network visibility, it's also to promote coordination with other networks, such as the CZIC networks. And just so everyone is aware, this seminar does take place the second Thursday of each month, 1030 to 12 p.m. Eastern time. We also uh, do record the speaker talks and post them to our YouTube and Billabilly sites. So if you're not able to join in real time, you will be able to watch on our YouTube and Billabilly channels. And we want to thank uh, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative for making this seminar series possible. So please be sure to submit and vote on questions using the Zoom, and a, the Zoom uh, Q and A chat function. The seminar format for today will be uh, Ed Line will give us a talk for 15 minutes. You'll be able to write in questions and he'll have five minutes to answer those questions. Then David uh, Rowich will have 15 minutes for his talk, followed by five minutes for Q&A. And then we're going to have a 45 minute panel discussion in this room. So we will not go into breakout sessions like we normally do. You'll stay right here in this room. And um, Sten and Omar will join Ed and David for that discussion. So without further ado, I will uh, introduce my colleague, Ellen Todris, who will kick us off. Hello, everyone. I'm really honored to introduce Dr. Ed Lin, uh, who's a senior investigator at the Allen Institute for Brain Science and an affiliate professor in the Department of Neurological Surgery at the University of Washington. He received a bachelor's degree in biochemistry from Purdue University and a PhD in neurobiology from UC Berkeley and performed postdoctoral work at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies. He joined the Allen Institute in 2004 and has provided scientific guidance for the creation of a large-scale gene expression atlases of the adult and developing uh, mammalian brain as catalytic, uh, catalytic, catalytic community resources, including the inaugural Allen Mouse Brain Atlas and a range of developmental and adult human and non-human primate brain atlases. Particular interests of Dr. Lean include using the transcriptome as a core phenotype to understand brain organization at the regional, cellular, and functional level. He now co-leads the cell types program and directs the human cell types department at the Allen Institute, aiming to create a comprehensive understanding of human cortical cell types and circuits and what is uh, specialized in human cortex using quantitative single cell transcriptomics anatomical and functional methods. Ed, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much for the introduction and for the opportunity to speak to you today. Let me share my screen here. Um, okay, um, so I'd, I'd like to spend this time to give a little bit of a, an overview uh, of progress in the neuro network. And really a lot of the work in the neuro network uh, is happening in the Brain Initiative Cell Census Network. Uh, this is a large coordinated effort that's funded by the NIH Brain Initiative uh, that has uh, brought together a, a large number of, of top researchers uh, studying different aspects of uh, brain cell types and circuits uh, to work together towards trying to create a cell census in the, in the mammalian brain. And this is a particularly great time to give this talk because uh, we've just had a, a major release of results from the first stage of this coordinated effort uh, that was just published in Nature last week, uh, seen here over on this sort of artistic representation of what a, a census of cell types looks like uh, in the brain here. Uh, I can, of course, only give a, a very brief whirlwind sort of overview of some of the main take-home messages. This is actually a package of 17 papers that I, I would really recommend that, uh, that you look at as sort of um, somewhat of a paradigm for how we approach uh, cell atlases in general. Um, the approach that was taken uh, as, as part of um, one of the initial efforts within this cell census was a little bit um, out of the page of genomics. So like the ENCODE project, for example, that, uh, that decided to focus on 1% of the genome uh, as an initial starting point for characterizing the genome. 
The cell census network uh, decided to focus on one part of the brain, say 1% of the brain, and pick um, a very complicated, functionally relevant region, the primary motor cortex, as its initial target. Uh, this was really chosen because it's a direct relationship to function, uh, because a lot was already known about cellular organization in the cortex that formed a good starting point, and because this is a region which is tightly linked to function and highly conserved across species that allowed this to, uh, to have a comparative axis to really start to understand mouse as a principal focus, but then moving into monkey and to human to start to understand uh, what elements are conserved and where there may be species specializations. The really kind of remarkable part of this, this uh, big consortium effort is that it allowed many groups to work together to focus on um, looking in, at cells in many different ways. So for example, uh, single cell omics has turned out to really be the basis of creating a foundational classification. But then we want to understand the spatial organization of those cell types and the phenotypic properties of these cells, their anatomy, their physiology. And for neurons um, in the brain, of course, uh, where they project and the wiring diagram that they make up uh, is, a, is a key component to understanding, not just the cells, but the circuits that they form. And so this big concerted effort, which is described in these papers, has led to a, a consensus classification of types that I'll describe, um, and a consensus cross-species classification of cell types as well, a spatial map, a characterization of many of the properties of these cells, and to some degree, a wiring diagram of these types. So the, at the really kind of the basis of this is, um, is a molecular characterization. This is particularly salient for the human cell atlas because these are the techniques that are common across all organ systems. And um, I think one of the um, salient outcomes from this overall effort is that the classification that we can derive uh, is robust across technology platforms. So for example, SmartSeq or different forms of 10X uh, across cells and nuclei. Um, and also consistent between the transcriptome and the epigenome. Um, and this really uh, came to light when comparing these using single cell data uh, coordinated in this way, that we can now really understand the chromatin architecture underlying gene expression, uh, which has a lot of pragmatic uh, implications for being able to identify enhancers and things like this. Um, <clears throat> a second really uh, key point is that uh, we've now been able to derive uh, through the work of Xia Wei Shuang um, and her application of MRFISH, a spatial map of cell types, um, particularly in the, in the mouse cortex. And uh, what is really observed is that uh, all of these different types of cells that can be defined transcriptomically have distinctive uh, spatial distributions. In the case of the cortex, this is uh, largely laminar distributions. Um, but many of these fine types are really intermingled with one another. Um, so we begin to understand the, the true cellular architecture of this complex region of the cortex. <clears throat> Application of the technique of PATSEQ, um, which allows you to, uh, to gain three different cellular modalities of neurons uh, in a single experiment, where you have a slice physiology experiment where you stimulate, record, uh, fill the neuron with a dye, and then extract the nucleus for sequencing, has allowed a characterization of, of most of these types and an illustration of where the molecular architecture correlates with the anatomical and physiological architecture. Um, and this has even been possible to do also for homologous types across species, uh, which illustrates um, a great deal of conservation, but also some highly specialized types as well. <clears throat> so the, the real sort of punchline here for the outcome of this whole effort is that we have a census and a classification and an atlas of cell types in this one complicated region of the cortex that then sets a paradigm for how to approach the rest of the brain. And ultimately this turned out to be a hierarchical organization where the hierarchy represents uh, developmental lineage to some degree. Uh, so for example, the upper level classes represent neurally derived cells versus non-neurally derived cells. Uh, then we have uh, within the neural lineage, we have neuronal and non-neuronal, within the neuronal, gabaritic, glutamatergic, et cetera. Um, and then down to the, the sort of subclass level. And at that level, really everything lines up. It lines up across phenotypes. It lines up across species. There are about 25 subclasses or so. And then at the moment, transcriptomics provides the greatest um, resolution beyond that. 
Uh, and so we have many more types that can be resolved at this finest level. Um, and now we understand that, uh, that many of these have distinctive uh, phenotypes, such as uh, where they send their axons to, uh, their firing properties and things like that. <clears throat> so we have a classification. We also understand their proportions in the circuits. And I think a particularly key thing from this work is that, um, is that most of these types are actually quite rare in the cortex. And so it's a, it's a system made of, of many different rare cell types that have a laminar organization, but also highly intermingled with one another. And, uh, and then furthermore, we now have an understanding of the basic anatomical and physiological properties of these cell types. So I think that this really is setting a paradigm for us for how we would begin to approach this um, brain-wide and how this could be extended to, of course, all of your organ systems that you work on as well. So this is largely in the mouse where, where this was done, but a, a really key advance um, as part of this whole cell census effort here was pushing this to start to work in the human and non-human primate. And I think this illustrates um, a couple of key points, um, one of which is sort of scientific, and that is that we're able to do this highly detailed genomic cell type classification using single nuclei derived from really any species, but here we've shown it in the marmoset and the human. So using these techniques, we're able to get uh, a very robust classification whose hierarchical architecture is, is extremely similar to what I just showed in the mouse. Uh, the other is sort of a community aspect that, that to do these, uh, these experiments, we really um, have collaborated extensively across the consortium and brought together different groups who specialize in human and non-human primate, different types of methods to really bring all of this together to get a really synthetic picture of, of um, cellular organization in primates. And uh, using that kind of data, um, it has now become uh, readily possible to align across species, to do a, a data integration across these different species data sets and a homology mapping so that we can uh, really understand which cell types are, uh, have homologs across species and where there may be specializations. And the outcome of this is really an identification of a, of a consensus taxonomy where the molecularly defined cell types can be aligned across species. It's a little bit less resolution than in any of the individual species, but basically all levels, all, all branches on this tree um, have homologs across the species. And this is particularly important for uh, human brain because many of these phenotypes of cells are extremely difficult to measure uh, in human itself. But by inference, by homology, we can uh, infer what the properties of these cells are likely to be and in many cases, we've actually tested this now, for example, with the patch seek types of methods, and it really holds up. <clears throat> so this basic cellular architecture is well conserved as homologous and it's rooted in the genome. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, a few surprises have sort of come out of some of this analysis. Um, one is that although I've emphasized the homology so far, there are also substantial species differences. And so while we uh, well, we can use the, the, the model system to define the basic architecture first and to define these homologies. It also allows us to now compare apples to apples across a species. And one of the surprises to me, at least, was that in each species, these different cell types have very distinctive molecular signatures. So for example, you can ask, what are the, cell, what are the genes that are enriched in parvalbumin cells versus all other inhibitory neurons? And you get an answer in, in each species. But when you ask what's the overlap across the species, it's actually the minority of genes. So it seems that the, there is a core molecular phenotype that underlies the cell identity, but then there's a huge amount of species specialization such that the most selective genes for those cell types actually are not the same genes across species. Another place where there can be uh, variation across the species is in cellular diversity. And so at the finest leaves of these taxonomies, uh, indeed, there do start to be some um, significant species specializations. One of the uh, areas that we've explored in my group um, is in the upper layers of the cortex, in the excitatory neurons of the supergranular layers. These are neurons that project to other parts of the cortex. And as the cortex has expanded in human evolution, so has the relative proportion of 
the layers that contain these cortical cortically projecting neurons. <clears throat> and so this was a, a place to that where we could imagine there should be a, a species specialization to go along with this expansion. And indeed, that's what the, the data predicts. Um, whereas in the mouse, there seem to be three transcriptomic types in the upper layers of the mouse cortex. In the human, it appears that there are five different types. And in fact, the, the characteristics of the human neurons have gotten much more complex. And in the deeper parts of those layers, uh, there are two types that don't appear to have homologs in the mouse. And they're highly distinctive types. One of the, some of the largest neurons in the cortex and right intermingled with them is another population, which is this very spindly neurons um, that identified by the gene coal 22A1, which is, which is a collagen, which may um, be involved in its um, connectivity as well. So this is something I think we'll see again and again. The basic sort of subclass level is highly conserved. And then we have um, specialization on top of that, which leads to functional uh, specialization in particular species. So uh, this was sort of meant as a, as a real whirlwind of some, some key topics. Uh, of course, just a tiny bit of the work that has come out in this uh, big package of publications. Uh, but I also wanted to give a little eye to the future you know, the, the proce process of, <clears throat> of generating these data <clears throat> and creating these atlases, <clears throat> excuse me, moves so much faster than publication that in the time it took to really assemble this work on one region of the brain, um, the mouse projects within the BICCN have effectively generated the data for the entire brain. And so uh, this fantastic image from Xi Zhen Yao as uh, part of Hong Kui Zheng's um, U19 to make an atlas of the mouse brain um, here shows the complete cellular architecture of the mouse brain, which is at the present, I believe the number is, is about 4,000 discriminable clusters. So that's probably the, the degree of complexity that we're dealing with, um, with the brain. Um, most of these are neuronal uh, types, but also a great deal of non-neuronal diversity as well. Um, and similar work is, is moving very fast in the human. Uh, so I'd like to highlight uh, some of the work that we've been doing with Sten Linnerson, uh, where we tried to make a, a pilot atlas of the human brain, which is also now nearing completion, looking at about 100 regions of the human brain and spinal cord. Um, and it's sort of life in the BICCN. Uh, this has been integrated now with, uh, with similar projects for single nucleus attack seek and methylation analysis too. Um, and it's the, really this sort of collaboration across the groups that has just dramatically accelerated things uh, to the point that now this is, um, this is moving into uh, the next phase of the Brain Initiative Cell Census Network, which is called the Cell Atlas Network, which is now aiming to try to achieve this highly granular comprehensive coverage in the human and non-human primate brain as well. At one minute, please. <clears throat> so let me just end, thank you very much, uh, by highlighting that the data that I've been describing here is available um, to the public uh, through the Brain Initiative resources. Uh, these include uh, archives for transcriptome and epigenome data, for electrophysiology data, uh, and for anatomy data, as well as a whole series of analysis tools for accessing these data. And so with that, I'd like to end and just um, thank the NIH Brain Initiative and its many, many collaborators. Uh, it's really not possible to uh, to list all of them, it's a remarkable community effort uh, sort of highlighted in this recent publication package uh, and the programmatic um, support for really trying to take advantage of this to, uh, for, uh, to enable us to work together and accelerate this field. So with that, uh, thank you very much for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Ed. Please do submit your questions uh, in, the, um, in the chat box in Zoom. Okay, if there are no questions, uh, I will introduce our next speaker. Please, if you do think of questions. Ellen, a uh, question just came in. Oh, great, thank you. Okay, so the question for you, Ed. Great talk. Um, Devika Agarwal is wondering, when you compare the differential genes across the different classes of neurons across species, did you look to see if the common genes defined the core functional of the neurons of interest or were there non-common genes the one defining this? 
Yeah, that's a that's a really fantastic question, and I think one that's that um, there's a lot of room to explore this question. Um, you know, at, at some level, we we simply have the transcriptome to try to interpret for that. <clears throat> so what I can tell you is that among those genes that that um, are common across the species are many genes that are very plausibly associated with cell identity or the core cellular phenotypes that define those types of cells. <clears throat> so for example, if you look for cells, uh, genes that, that are common across species defining a very phenotypically conserved type, the chandelier cell, it's a type of GABAergic um, inhibitory interneuron. There's only a small set of genes that's actually conserved across those three species, but within there are several transcription factors and several axon guidance genes. <clears throat> and one of the, the core um, phenotypes of these cells is that <clears throat> they selectively make connections directly onto what's called the axon initial segments of the excitatory neurons. And so they're right at the trigger zone where they can have a profound influence on the activity of that neuron. So, um, you know, within all the possible genes here, we have a couple of transcription factors, which uh, I think would be good candidates for the, the overall cellular identity and also um, axon guidance genes that may well mediate the that selective connectivity. <clears throat> this is, you know, I could, I could give more examples. Um, this is kind of the case across many of these cell types. So, but at the moment, there's still hypotheses. You know, someone needs to actually go test them. Uh, but I think that this, you know, actually, this is really, a, I think, an important outcome of this comparative work is that it winnows the field down to a small number of candidates that are really testable now for, for those core phenotypes, or if you're interested to look at uh, human specializations, for example. Great. Thank you. So another question comes from uh, Bruce Arno. The point about the best markers not to be cross-species gener generalizable. What is the best approach to deal with that? Stick to the best per species or use next best to both or hybrid or? Um, hi, Bruce. So, I, I mean, I, I think this is a great question. I would, I would suggest that there are enough markers that we actually can use that. So, I mean, there are many genes that differentiate these cell types. Um, it's a it's a smaller subset of them that actually uh, define them across more species. Um, to me, those those genes occupy sort of a special space. Those are those are the ones that related to the previous question are probably related to their core identity, but they also provide a sort of a common language to use across the species. Um, <clears throat> you know, if, if you if you use the best markers in any given species. You often find yourself using non-coding RNAs and things that you actually know nothing about the function of. So, um, so while those are, you know, perhaps the the most useful in species at, for their specificity, I would suggest that the probably the, the the more salient set of genes are actually the conserved ones. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Ed. Um, so we're moving on uh, to our next speaker. Um, the next speaker is uh, Dr. David Rowich. Uh, David is a neonatologist and developmental neuroscientist. He is a professor and head of Department of Pediatrics at the University of Cambridge and adjunct professor of pediatrics at the University of California in San Francisco. Originally from California, he obtained his MD from University of California, Los Angeles, and PhD in biochemistry from the University of Cambridge. David became a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator in 2007 and Wellcome Trust Senior Investigator in 2016. He was appointed to the National Advisory Council for Child Health and Development in USA in 2020. His research in the field of developmental neurobiology and biomedicine has earned him numerous awards, including election as Fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences in the UK in 2018 and Fellow of the Royal Society in 2021. Um, David Rowich's laboratory in the Wellcome MRC Cambridge Stem Cell Institute investigates genetic factors that determine development and diversity of glia. His laboratory has established how embryonic central nervous patterning specifies myelinating oligodendrites, uh, sorry, oligodendrocytes through essential functions of OLI2, a study that helped initiate era of developmental genetics in glial biology, and how astrocyte functional diversification is critical for support of neural circuits and spinal cord. 
He has applied principles of developmental neuroscience to better understand human neonatal brain development, as well as white matter injury in premature infants, multiple sclerosis, and uh, leukodystrophy. As a physician scientist, uh, Dr. Rowich's interest focuses on functional genomics uh, technologies to better diagnose and treat rare neurogenic disorders in children. At UCSF, uh, he helped establish the NeuroNICU, and he led a phase one first in men clinical study of neural stem cell transplant in boys with PMD. He's academic lead for the new Cambridge Children's Hospital researching origins of pediatric physical and mental conditions and preventative interventions within the UK National Health Service. David, welcome and thanks. Okay, th um, thanks very much, Ellen, for that um, nice introduction. And um, I'm, uh, tell me if I, if you can see me share my screen. Um, yes. Definitely. Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to sort of talk at the other end of the spectrum. I mean, Ed has presented this great, you know, view of the, um, you know, diversity at a global scale. And what I want to focus on would, would be the high resolution techniques that will help us define characteristics of RNA in, in cell types that will, will, I think, represent another important aspect um, provoking biological questions. And Ellen mentioned the OLIG genes and their role in brain development and disease. And this is probably the most important spatial transcriptomic experiment I ever did in my career, which was the whole mount um, of uh, OLIG2 in the embryo. And you can see it's a beautiful example of uh, 3D map you know, uh, in a cleared embryo. And this, I think, does represent an aspiration for where we want to go with some of the single cell techniques and rebuilding, you know, that complexity at the tissue level. Now, of course, you know, um, this is a non-quantitative technique. And I think we can go further now with, with small molecule fish and other approaches to become quantitative and, and define gene expression in, with even more precision. Uh, OLIG2 genes are expressed in multipotent neural progenitor cells, and they're essential for the specification of the oligodendrocyte lineage, and these are the cells that provide myelin and therefore enable efficient neural circuit function and efficient um, conduction. The lineage also can be prone to problems, and so I'm going to touch on two in this talk, both glial tumors that can emerge from a uh, OLIG2 positive precursor and also the impact of the lineage in the neuroinflammatory condition, multiple sclerosis. Um, because I'm sort of a new, newcomer to this talk, I wanted to sort of maybe uh, show a few papers and interactions I've had with brain initiative labs like Arnold Kriegstein at UCSF and Dan, Dan Geshwin at UCLA, and also highlight work today from Omar Baraktar, who will be um, chairing the panel uh, and some of his work in um, high resolution imaging of uh, RNAs. So um, this is kind of what I wanted to, to maybe address the, what I'm, I guess I'm going to call the Humpty Dumpty problem, where you know, we ultimately want to reconstruct 2D and 3D tissue maps in human at scale, but we may be starting with single cell or, or single nuke RNA-seq data or you know, low resolution um, high plexity data. And so we have you know, a number of techniques available that all have their advantages and disadvantages like single cell approaches that have high plexity but may lack or have lost the spatial information of where they were and registered other cells, other high plexity techniques um, that can cover large areas but may be low resolution because they don't actually give you a, a cell type specific association or high plexity small area high resolution where the problem is how do you scale that for a tissue like the human brain and then are they quantitative? So here to focus on the uh, techniques to determine quantitative gene expression per cell and even at subcellular re resolution and, and, and ways that we can, in, a, in an automated image capture, you know, um, incorporate all of this more complex um, high resolution data into our approach to spatial transcriptomics. Um, now, when Omar was postdoc in my lab and, and working with Teresa Bartels, a PhD student, uh, developed a technique that we termed large area spatial transcriptomics which used a single molecule fish technique. And this um, you know, is, a, is a, a nice image to show the, the, the layer organization that Ed um, showed in much greater detail in his talk with a few of the classic sort of layer specific neuronal markers. Of course, we can start to think about that with respect to astrocytes as well. And what LastMap uses is RNA scope, which um, can be uh, performed on a, on, a, on a bond automated um, um, labeler to give us 
for color or with stripping and reprobing up to about 16 plex. So it's very low plexity. Um, scanning confocal automated imaging. And then with the appropriate marker sets, it's possible to write scripts to be able to segregate cell types and then count um, uh, the spots per cell. And then uh, we can also re-register because these are, are obviously all tissue acquired um, where those spots live. And then we can render maps that will show not only location, but also the quantification and the, and the level of gene expression in a given layer. So that if we take our if we take our, our, our raw data and break it down into um, slightly higher resolution, and now this would be last map analyzed and then reinterpreted into a 2D map um, with quantification. And as you would expect, it gives us back the, the, the layers that we'd see with human eye, but this just sort of demonstrates proof of concept that this is a technique that can capture quantification and then report it back as a 2D map. It can also be used to, to identify new genes um, and put them into context. So these were now genes that were expressed in astrocytes and we could use this technique um, in combination with RNA-seq to be able to um, identify layer uh, associated markers of astrocytes to try to you know, um, describe better how that population is diverse. And of course that will provoke questions about you know, what is, the layer, what is the layer two astrocytes function versus a deep layer astrocytes function, which might be indicated by some of the differential gene expression patterns. Now, we've also applied this technique um, in the context of human brain and human um, disease and work of Lucas Shermer and Dmitry Velshemev um, uh, took on the challenge of, of NUCSEQ in human multiple sclerosis uh, using techniques that you'll be familiar with uh, where um, we took the step of, you know, validating um, the findings from NUCSEQ uh, using um, high resolution uh, small molecule fish. Um, and there's some surprises that come out, but when you get to very low resolution, so this would be a, sort of a transcriptomic picture of multiple sclerosis. As you know, this is a disease of the white matter where neuroinflammatory plaques can form, and then you'll lose myelin in that region. And an indicator of myelin or ligand dendrocytes is MBP or myelin basic protein. And here's an, an area that has obviously lost its, its, its MBP expression. Um, and uh, if you look also in the plaque with the inflammatory marker of innate immune system CD68, you'd see you know, there's not too, too much going on here. This is what we would call a chronic MS plaque. In contrast, here's an active MS plaque with lots of inflammatory cells. And it's in this region of the peri plaque where we think uh, that progression and active destruction of myelin is taking place. So you do see some MVP protein, uh, sorry, MVP RNAs, but it's, it's you know, decimated compared to a normal appearing white matter region. And when you look at higher resolution, what's going on in some of the microglia in this peri plaque, and you find some surprises that were just sort of provocative. If we looked in the nuclei of microglia, um, we could identify within the volume described by Daffy, um, a suggestion that there were MVP and PLP transcripts within the nucleus. And so that was sort of surprising, but it actually also um, fit with what we had found um, from NUCSEQ, and this would be different clusters of the uh, microglial macrophage lineage um, from the NUCSEQ data. And importantly, um, Dimitri wrote this script such that we um, could include, but we could also remove the doublet filter. So without a doublet filter, a kind of a weird cluster came up, cluster F, and what made it strange was these were phagocytes, but they had a number of transcripts um, that you'd associate with the oligodendrocyte lineage, such as myelin basic protein. And you might say, well, that's an artifact, or that is a doublet. Um, but with you know, high-resolution uh, spatial transcriptomics, you know, we, we, we can examine that. And now go back, uh, and this would be work that John Zhu is doing to now um, look at high resolution and also auto, um, automate imaging to be able to capture um, the location of RNAs within microglia um, as, as a new way of reporting. So we would find, for example, um, in this periplaque region shown here with the sort of the pink box, um, you know, many RNA transcripts that have been ingested by the microglia, but also um, in many cases, uh, integration or incorporation of those transcripts within the volume of the nucleus. And you can kind of appreciate that on the, you know, sort of 3D uh, reconstructed movie 
Um, and this is labeled with CD68, which in activated microglia does nicely sort of label the volume of the, of the cytoplasm or the cell body, and then DAPI for the nucleus. John then wanted to you know, come up with a, a nuclear capture by training DAPI against lamin AC, which is an authentic nuclear membrane marker, and found that DAPI was a very good proxy such that he was able to now, uh, in an automated way, render the nucleus per cell and then be able to count the number of MVP transcripts that might be present in different um, parts of an MS lesion, such as a uh, normal appearing white matter, which has very few counts, as you might expect, or, or these rim phagocytes, which have you know, many um, myelin basic protein transcripts that they've ingested. And also we can come up with lots of other ways of, of capturing um, um, location of those RNAs, such as this cytoplasm to nuclear ratio, which can be another way of, of describing the content of, or even the, 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 the nature of microglia found in different parts of the MS plaque. So that this is now a, a routine part of the imaging that we can use to be able to look at a deeper level at um, uh, the you know, potential biological significance of subcellular localization of RNA uh, as we start to develop uh, high resolution 2D and 3D maps. Now that data had contributed to, to the following model in which phagocytosis of myelin in, the pre in MS uh, results in the ingestion of RNA transcripts um, known to be packed in myelin. Uh, but then surprisingly, there was a import of those transcripts into the nucleus for reasons that we're still um, investigating. Um, and um, interestingly, though, we do find that in the presence of this nuclear ingestion or import, um, there seems to be the ability to then translate those RNAs and this may be part of an ongoing inflammatory response. So we do think there's some biological significance to this import. And we do think that now there's a tool to be able to capture in cases where transcripts may have localization within the nucleus, certainly of microglia. And that's partly because CD68 was such a great marker for activated microglia, which looked completely different than resting. And it filled the cytoplasm so we could segment the cell and that allowed us to do um, counts. And then using DAPI, I think that'll be a great um, way to more routinely capture um, the nuclear volume, at least with nuclei that have a nice sort of spherical shape. Um, we can also go deeper. This is, this is an example of, of small molecule, oh, sorry, single molecule fish with stead. Um, and this would be in a, in a native myelin sheath where uh, we can also start to look at the, the, the localization of RNAs within myelin. And this has this intriguing sort of um, pool uh, appearance. We're also, um, performing this with electron microscopy. So this will give us even greater uh, detail. Of course, then the, the scalability is gonna go way down. Um, and of course you can apply this, this approach to other cell types. Um, Teresa Bartels is interested in the expression of CDKL5 RNA uh, in multiple cell types. Uh, and so you can see how um, its expression does not show the same nuclear uh, co-localization, as I showed you for MBP and microglia, this, this has a more of a cytoplasmic localization. Here's, here's an expression pattern within astrocytes, which is a lower expressor, and a ligand endocytes, which express very little um, CDKL5. And with automated scripts and with um, these types of approaches, what Teresa can do is look at a developmental dynamic expression characterization of CDKL5 across developmental time and then across lineages and across the entire brain. So the last map technique will capture the entire you know, brain and we can at you know, high resolution, um, including perhaps subcellular resolution, characterize the expression pattern and quantification of a gene um, you know, in, 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 across a large area, which was our initial ambition. We think this will provoke further questions about um, regulation of the gene and potentially um, how subcellular localization would be related to the function of that RNA. David, one minute, please. Okay, that's great. I'm just going to wrap up to say this is the beginning, I think, of some, uh, and we'll, we'll have new funding um, to be able to um, expand um, on these techniques uh, with new funding from the Pediatric Cell Atlas. Um, as following perfectly from what Ed's uh, topic was, looking at M1 of developing human in the third trimester, these would be 
preterm neonates that might have died or full-term infants to be able to complement and provide some more developmental perspective on the atlas of M1. And then uh, a, a new grant that Omer has from Welcome Leap GBM Space that will be using a variety of multiomic techniques to be able to characterize and then rebuild the 2 and 3D maps of glioblastoma, which is a highly heterogeneous tumor, both at the RNA and the protein level. And we may have time for questions with Omer there. So just to, to, to um, end up, last map is feasible in the human brain. It can capture cell type morphology, potentially cell state with the right markers, subcellular localization, and um, raises some questions about RNA trafficking. This, this issue of segmentation, both of the cell uh, plasma membrane and the nucleus is key to quantification. I think that there'll be some interesting work to improve that and that will provoke further biological questions. I've mentioned most of the people along the way, so I think I will uh, stop there. Thanks for your attention.